Hi, so here we are. Finally, we're talking about the MOSFET. This is the introduction to it, the section 30. Of course, this is in the context of having gone through the whole course by now, almost the whole course. We're touching the final device we want to touch in this course. And we'll talk about equilibrium conditions and uh, DC bias conditions. And uh, here we are. You've seen the sketch of this type of device, and we're going to start looking first at the sub-threshold region. This is the region where we do not have minority carriers under the oxide yet. So we're just operating it in depletion. Okay, It's biased such that the acceptors are being um, exposed and we have a depletion region and we will have a few uh, uh, minority carriers available in the system. All right, so what can happen is you can have a few electrons flow um, under the gate, but we're operating at sub-threshold. So na by uh, natural generation, there will not be uh, uh, a significant amount of minority carriers. They are now coming in from the source and they flow towards the drain. Okay, here we go. So this is now becoming a, a multi-dimensional device. It's not a perfect uh, 1D device anymore. And we'll be spending a lot of time on plots of surface diagrams trying to symbolize the effect of a 2D device. Okay. So if we don't have a significant gate voltage applied yet, what you, and if you look along this device in this direction here, you can basically see that you have an N plus P, N plus region from source through the uh, body and then again to the drain. Okay, So let's assume we have no voltages applied like this. Okay, And you just have band bending like this. So you basically have again P, o, P N diodes that are back to back. Uh, but in the classical sense, these diodes are quite far away from each other. So they're not like the BJT where the junctions are pretty close, right? So in the olden days, this would be a pretty long distance here between source and drain. So it does look like two PN junctions, but remember this distance is uh, quite far away and now it's being done in 2D. Okay, so this device, um, so here is, um, uh, we talk about the width of this transistor, so we're looking down into the depth so we're looking down from here. If you did this in 3D, um, the device would look like this, right? Okay. So we're trying to get an understanding of how the potentials uh, uh, flow and how the electrons, uh, well, how the potentials behave in this two-dimensional representation. We're typically looking in this direction and in this direction, okay? Which here on this sketch, that is X and this is Y, okay? And then there is a, a width W of this overall system. That's the left over Z direction. We consider that to be infinitely large uh, for all uh, calculations, meaning there's no variations, spatial variations in that direction, and we just multiply by some width, because the transistor ultimately will have some width over which the electrons will flow. Okay, so for an electron, say, sitting in the source, they will go up and down uh, like this, and it's, uh, again, by um, um, just PN junction-like transport, there is no uh, voltage is applied in the system yet, right? So you have a uh, uh, um, conduction and valence band that are distributed like this, source and drain. And now you can ask yourself, what if you apply a gate voltage to this uh, structure? So you apply a voltage here to this gate. Now that means you bend the bands in this dimension here, okay, into the depth of the semiconductor. 
into the depth X here. So you're building in a ramp, so to speak, closer to the gate, you lower the barrier, okay? So you lower the barriers for electrons to flow like this, and if you compare the two, this barrier for electrons got lowered. Okay. So again, you apply a voltage uh, to the gate, the gate potential in this direction, we've sketched that many times now, this is in the capacitor calculations our uh, uh, potential, we calculated the psi uh, uh, s and its spatial distribution, but now the spatial distribution of that varies across the direction y, okay? The background gate here is typically held at a fixed potential. Okay. Again, here this is how we calculated the MOS capacitor. Okay. Now, if you squint a little bit and forget about this being a 2D type system, what you will remember, this looks like a PN diode uh, in one direction, and if you look overall, it looks like a BJT where you have an injection of carriers from diffusion. You can calculate the boundary condition, and if you had an overall voltage applied and you don't have back injection from the other side, the carriers will decay, and you will have um, thermal flow, dif uh, diffusion flow uh, induced by this uh, PN junction. Okay? So it kind of starts, if this is really short, it looks like a BJT if it's long. Um, you have diffusion uh, coefficients uh, in the system. If you apply a voltage here, like what we did here, you will drive the currents in a particular direction. Okay. Good. So, in the subthreshold region, when we are injecting carriers like a PN diode, what do we expect? Well, uh, the drain current will be uh, the charge at the beginning of the channel and at the end of the channel, divided by some channel length. This is old stuff now, right? You've done this now multiple times with the diffusion coefficient. Um, this channel will have a certain inversion uh, uh, width, okay? And the, the transistor has an overall width, and we can multiply those to get a um, the charge, and we calculate a charge density, an expression to something that is, looks very familiar to you now, except we plug in here the surface uh, potential psi s as, a, as an energy level. Okay, so other than that, you've seen this so many times now, and you can plot the increase of current again, and uh, it looks like a diode current, right? Uh, forward bias diode current. And um, this is called subthreshold. And uh, what are its characteristics? Well, it goes as uh, uh, KT with a beta in here, right? And it has some uh, body coefficient, a modulation that we had discussed. So the, the gate voltage is not directly translated in the surface potential uh, here, but it's modulated by the factor of M. So the slope between those two of the scaling is not exactly uh, the same, but the subthreshold slope is 60 millivolt per decade, and that has purely to do with uh, 1 over kBT at t equal 300 Kelvin. You can calculate the slope and you will find it at 60 millivolt per decade. That's the best the absolute best this kind of transistor can deliver, okay? And the slope is in practice a little bit uh, directed in this, dire uh, this way due to the body coefficient in these longer transistors. Uh, in nanoscale transistors, the non-ideality is from, from some other effects, but this slope is the best, turn-on is the best you can potentially expect from a transistor like this. Again, ideally, you would love to have a switch that turns on like this, right? With very little voltage, you can turn this thing on and off. 
But the fact in these devices is it now turns on at 60 millivolt per decade the best possible way in this kind of configuration. Okay, so then uh, eventually you hit threshold and um, get to high injection and the, the current tapers off and we'll talk about that as well. Okay. And here we are, here are some curves of uh, drain current as a function of gate voltage from the textbook and here are the slopes that we just described. So this is going down over orders of magnitude it goes down as a constant linear term on a log scale. Okay. Okay, remember the definition of the body uh, coefficient. It has to do with a, a parallel capa uh, series capacitance of the oxide capacitance and the semiconductor capacitance, and that semiconductor capacitance is variable as a function of gate voltage depending on the distribution of charges you have in the system. Now, it's a 2D distribution, and we'll be doing a lot of song and dance on how to calculate the charge in the semiconductor as it's distributed under the gate. In the MOS device, it was a perfect 1D case. Now we're having a potentials applied across the capacitors, so to speak, in the transverse direction to the plates, so to speak, here in these directions. So our capacitor is spatially varying. Okay. Again, here, um, is the definition. Just recall it's uh, based on this uh, uh, series capacitance and it contains the the ratio here Ks over kappa s over um, kappa oxide and it goes Wt those two go together and then it goes as oxide capacitance and kappa uh, oxide, okay? So you have two series capacitors and the ratio between these coefficients can vary as a function of gate voltage. It is convenient to define this term and we'll see that later. All right, so that was the sub-threshold behavior of the turn-on of a uh, transistor. And next we'll look at the above threshold on the inversion current. I'll see you at that section.